Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this latest um, Coaching Conversations in Tennis webinar. And I'm delighted um, again to have my, my two friends and colleagues, Avoye and Frank, discussing a new topic this morning on the, the issue and the area of tactics in tennis. So we get into a real tennis specific topic um, this morning, and we hope that we'll be able to unpack over the next kind of hour or so you know the role of tactics and how we would define it and, and the, its usefulness in in playing the game but also then stepping back from that and talking about well how is it best coached and and how can we help players really become tactical wizards on the court so not only do they hit the ball well but they play the game effectively as well so really excited about this morning um i'm going to kick off right away and, and pose just a mini question to to the guys by by wanting you to in, in your experience in your vast experience as coach educators to talk about tactics per se and 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 just introduce tactics as, as a topic to the group and and why you think it's such an important area to both teach as coaches but also to to be able to implement as players why do you think tactics is so, so important in the game of tennis in the evolving game when it's becoming so powerful the technology has changed the way people are hitting the ball the technique has changed the way the, the game is becoming more physical more athletic why is tactics still such an important part of being an effective tennis player so i'll hand that over to both of you to, to kind of unpack a little bit and, and see where we go from there can i start just with a simple uh, answer to a question why it is important to talk about tactics because the goal of tactics ultimately is always to win so it's actually to find a win a way to win in the match and uh, that's why we are playing tennis frank over to you after this very quick one <laughs> yeah I, I agree on that also a short answer but a little uh, more detail is it is to win the match um also tactics is important to win a set a game and actually, the smallest level, or the uh, yeah, the smallest level is is uh, of course winning the point. And uh, for that, it's important to play. And um, I'm really uh, enjoying the fact that kids are playing in a red court, in an orange court, and a green court, and then to the yellow court, and really playing the game and using the time and space to win points. So when you compare that to, let's say a few decades ago where we were mostly focusing on technique, it is so good to see that they're more, let's say allowed to, to play the game and to discover the tactical element without even talking about it, but they will automatically apply tactics uh, to be able to win the points and, and have fun in this game. Interesting, because one of the one of the things that um, I'll share a story with you, if I may. I remember captaining in a, a British team um, at a European tournament. I can't remember exactly which one. And, and I spoke to some of the foreign coaches and I asked them what their perception was of British players. And you know, a couple of them said the same thing, which I thought was really interesting, which is, you know, you British players, you, you look great, you move great, you hit the ball great, but you can't play the game. And that, that, that was something that was reiterated to me, as I said, several times at different, different events. And, and I thought that was interesting that we had a label that way, that, that we were great hitters of the ball, but we weren't particularly great tactical thinkers and implementers of the game. Now, what, how can that be possible, guys? Let's unpack that, that people can, can strike the ball beautifully, but when they come to play a match, because you said tactics is ultimately about helping you to try and win more points or lose less points. How, how can that occur, do you think, in the, in, in the modern game? Well, I, I have a, an example from many years ago, probably 30 years back, when British players came over to the Netherlands to play on our slow clay courts. And we were always happy to play British players right. because coming from a grass court, it's a different game. And in those days, most of the British players had no clue what to do. They, they were hitting... Uh, too early down the line shots and, and giving the opportunity to the experienced clay court player to open the <coughs> court and make them run like crazy. And, you know, um, that has changed a lot. Nowadays, now that you also have slower courts the, and even on grass, the, the, the game is a bit slower. So it helped a lot for, in this case, British players to, to become better players by having different court services and a little bit more time on court to make your decisions 
compared to a grass court. Or I remember playing in Torquay on the wooden court. You had no time to think about whatever kind of decision. So that's really different story nowadays. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay. Boy, what do you think? Yeah, but I can share with you a story from my experience that I uh, made in uh, Turkey related to your question. And uh, it, we started the projects to develop uh, or to improve the player's quality uh, for, I'd say, a bit younger, uh, sorry, all the juniors, 14 to 18. And in the first step, we agreed that we will create a, uh, or better say, organize a training camp with the best, uh, with the coaches of the best players and best players in terms of the most promising one, 15, 16 years old. And after two, three days, uh, something was weird for me. And I also didn't uh, realize immediately, but then, then it came into my mind that what I see on the court are the players that actually looks like Swedish or German players playing with the top spin, with tempo, and this kind of stuff. And at the same time, there were uh, actually two uh, players, uh, sorry, two coaches there that just finished their career as a Davis Cup players for Turkey. And they play, played totally different uh, type of game with a lot of different uh, spins, change of the rhythm, like uh, Arami, Arazi, and these, let's say, Mar very famous fa American players. And uh, then I asked the guys, but Look, is it not weird for you that actually the best players are playing different type of the game, a different philosophy in the game? And uh, the conclusion for me is that very often, perhaps also the British coaches are copying some other games without looking at themselves. Because when you look at the successful nations like uh, Spanish is perhaps the best, uh, uh, the most uh, easiest uh, example, that they respect actually their personalities that are like a common traits, traits, like they like to suffer, for example, they like to play long points. And uh, this is something what we have to be aware of when we talk about developing uh, tactics, game style, actually in a particular country. Of course, there are some like a common uh, rules, but without looking at yourself and which are your strengths at, at home, I believe that then you are missing very important element in developing players' tactics. Interesting. So, so why well, loads of things to to kind of unpack from that, and I'm just thinking carefully where I go. I, I guess let's just back up a little bit. I think Frank and you, well, as your boy, it was you that said, well, the purpose of tactics is essentially to help you, you know, win more points to, to ultimately win the match that you're in. So I, I, um, I love that. And it really is, you know, when we talk about strategy in tennis, I often define it that way, that the, the strategy is the objectives to win the match and, and the tactical part of the strategy is the game plan. Um, and, and often the role of the coach is to help prepare a well-executed game plan in order to help the player have the best chance of winning the match. That, that, that's ultimately what the coach's role is on, on, on traveling in the tournaments. But, but in a training level, tactics, tactics is what exactly? Let's, let's really def try and define what we mean by tactics. How, how would you two answer that question? Well... Um, I, I would like to refer to uh, uh, a book, and, and I know Roy and, and me have talked about that, um, by Joan Vickers from Canada, a former professor in Vancouver University. And she has this book, it's called uh, Perception, Cognition, Decision um, in, in uh, sports, you know, so it's, it's uh, not tennis specific, but she uh, spends a lot of time on what she calls gaze and, and gaze would be like staring um, normally but um, it's like focusing on the perception and like a deliberate uh, perception of what you need to see on the court um, and the other uh, element is it's about decision <coughs> training and in decision training uh, I think uh, not a lot of coaches are used to work on decision training it's very often that we give, um, um, the, we have stories, we have experiences, we have general theories about how it should be. Um, and then we are annoyed when the player doesn't do it. So we should have, um, let's say, uh, a way to, to help players to see the, the, the essential things on court and take the proper decisions. And we have to make that simple. We shouldn't be able, um, we should be able to, to talk a little bit, uh, make it very clear and simple so that they can experience success as soon as possible. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, yeah. I'd just like to add, yeah, 
uh, what are the elements that really can help players to make decisions actually is to look at the right things at the right time like uh, to see the ball coming out of the opponent's racket to recognize direction of incoming ball uh, to actually adjust yourself according to different trajectories seeing opponents movement on court and being aware about your own position are just some of the elements that can help us to make decision uh, decisions during the points but always for me also is the uh, the uh, very important question how actually the players really uh, develop these skills because it's at the end automatic i like to call it more tactical reactions than tactical de decision making because there is no time really to make decisions and there are several like uh, uh, studies and there's different theories behind it. Uh, what we know now is that uh, what the experts are really doing, they're able to recognize the patterns and actually they connect what they see with, with actually what they will do, what will be their action or what is called also uh, perception and uh, perception action coupling. That's a nice uh, new phrase for this, uh, what we, we are using. Mm -hmm. but I believe that coaches should be aware about it and really look for the ways to apply these ideas in the practice so <clears throat> if i understand both of you correctly you know the, the the word that both of you jumped on and and mentioned quite repeated quite a few times was this idea of decision making so it you know there was the, the itf said this many years ago and, and it stuck with me and, and i understand the the message behind it which was it could only ever really be decision making it could only ever be tactical training if there's a decision making um involved so that was something that was banded around, you know, conferences and symposiums and workshops and, and in a lot of the ITF material. And I think most federations kind of picked up on that and used that. But but A, is that true? So I think we should unpack that as a, as a, as a concept that, that it really is only ever tactical training if there's a decision making involved. And secondly, what do we actually mean by tactical decision making? What, what are the decisions that we're wanting our players to make tactically in the match to help them ultimately win more points and lose less points? Yeah, um, I, I like to, to say this. Um, the, the, the thing that's always linked to, um, uh, to tactics is patterns. And I strongly believe in the, the effectiveness of patterns. And it's, uh, it's well known that a lot of players have favorite patterns and um, they like these patterns especially on big points many years ago the German Federation had a scientific approach to that and they found um, preferences for patterns in in top level in tennis so that's quite interesting however to master the pattern it's actually just technique and it's not easy, but it's when you know that the balls have to go there and there and there in a certain sequence so that you have a pattern, it is a technical um, technique mastery. Um, so when you talk about decisions, I would go, like to go back to the element of uh, space and time. Um, so this is the field of uh, Albert Einstein, who, um, who has a lot of theory about that. But just in all games, in all sports, um, time and space are essential. So whether you hit it full speed um, and deep into the corner or lower speed and with more angle is a very quick thing to, to decide on what is the best option now that I'm in this position and you are in that position. And these very quick responses are, are always there. And I think the decision is always there. Um, players have to do that. I've seen brilliant players technically who had no clue what to do to get the opponent in, in, in trouble. And they would hit it harder and harder, not seeing that the other player is just enjoying himself. So these decisions are certainly there. And um, we all know that you have to, to quickly see the situation or oversee the situation to make the right decision. That's what we should practice. Interesting. Voye, anything you want to add in there on, on decision making and technical training? Because, uh, what the Frank just said, I also agree uh, with him, is about developing patterns. And uh, here I believe there are two terms that are very important. One is actually core geometry, because very often the patterns are based on the core geometry, but also on the uh, high percentage principles. 
that's again a link with the same. And uh, actually creating awareness about this and ma make it really, I would call it in conscience by the young players, it's for me perhaps the first, the first thing to do. Because when we also look at the top players, I uh, dare to say that 80% of the Djokovic and Nadal's decisions, when you make it in a slow, a slow motion, actually a very high percentage <laughs> affecting core geometry in very simple way, but extremely high quality of the shots. Mm. Because very many coaches are also emphasizing is the, like a variety and variability. Uh, of course, not against it at all, but uh, in my opinion, you cannot have a variety if you don't have patterns, because that would be a random play. So, so one one of the things that um, just for the listeners, one of the ways that we defined it, myself and Louis Kaya at the LTA, we we took a long time to try and really help develop a culture of tactical coaching within British tennis, and it was to, essentially for a couple of reasons. A, we recognised that as a, as, a, as a federation at the LTA, we weren't investing probably in the tactical side it was always on biomechanics injury prevention athletic development and and we probably ignored the tactical side of coach education for some time and look there's a few reasons for that you know there's been such an emergence of the way people hit the ball it's changed so much um, whereas the game hasn't changed that much you know the scoring is the same and the court size is the same and the service box is the same like the geometry of the court she stayed the same for 150 years so so we, we didn't invest enough into tactics and Louie and I decided to to get together and, and go well you know what how was it defined in the past and it was defined the ITF way which was strategy at the top tactics in the middle patterns at the bottom you have a strategy you find a tactic and then you build a pattern and that kind of made sense to us because it was a nice natural hierarchical umbrella way of breaking it down to a micro level of when you go to the court you work on patterns so that that made sense to us but then we started to think well is strategy really time, space, consistency, you know, or is that tactics? So, so we, we completely re remodeled that um, original framework and we said, well, strategy is its own world. Let, let's remove strategy from everything because strategy is strategy, tactics is tactics, technique is technique. Yes, they're integrated and you need all of those to be able to play the game effectively, but just for, for methodological purposes, let's break it down. So strategy is the objectives to win the match and the game plan is the tactical side of that. Now, what do we mean by the tactics of the game? Well, you know, the way I always explain it to coaches, is if you were to explain the game of tennis to an alien from planet Neptune and they landed on, the, on Earth tomorrow, how would you explain it? Well, it's a game played by two or four players, singles or doubles. You know, you need an, an opponent. It's not just playing against yourself. You need some type of court that's the space um, and it's my space and your space because i have to cover my court and i have to exploit your court um there's no time element to it of course tennis you know there is you know you can play for 20 minutes you can play for three hours four hours five hours you know that there is no 90 minute clock that's running down that's a really interesting unique part of tennis um you play on different environments sometimes indoors sometimes outdoors you play um and different score lines and sometimes your tactics change based on the score line you're in so, so, so what we recognize is that, you know, the score is unique. It's this 15 love, 40 love, juice advantage. It's a very, very different type of scoring mechanism from other sports. Um, and that's the game of tennis. So everything tactically you do is linked to those six pillars, which is the player, the opponent, space, time, the environment, and the score line. That's the game of tennis in a nutshell. So, everything tactics to us was about knowledge and skills to play the game effectively in order to have the ultimate outcome, which you said at the start to try and win more points, lose less points to, to, to ultimately win the match. So, so, so that, that was a useful starting point for us, how we redefine tactics and it's not how everyone redefines it. And Brad Gilbert in winning ugly, will talk about tactics in a very different way, but I think there have been some books evolutionary that have moved tactics along to a deeper level to the, to the place we're at right now, which is kind of, well, a lot of the tactical conversations that are having are around statistical analysis, right? And that links to patterns. Well, where does he serve on big points? Um, when he approaches down the line, does he approach more down the line or approach cross court? You know, does he, when he goes to his back end, does he play more slice or does he come over the ball? You know, a lot of these are done through now statistical analysis and that's changed a lot over the last 10 years. And I, I wondered if, if you wanted to just ex explore that a little bit, the, the evolutionary assessment of tactics within players, either with juniors or at the professional game. Do you guys want to just jump on that a little bit? 
sure, um, about the evaluation of or how, how, it, how it developed through the years. Um, my first memory of tactics, there were two books, American books, by a gentleman called Talbert and Old. And Talbot was a world-class player. I don't know about this other guy. Um, it was called the game of singles in tennis and the game of doubles in tennis. And you had all the names of the players from the 50s. A lot of names people would not recognize now, but they were top level players. And so what they did, I think in the 70s or maybe 80s, they, they um, re-published re, uh, it again. And they took all these names out and they just called the players player A and player B, just not to be bothered by these names that had been forgotten. Right. And the, the essential part of the book was that they had all kinds of situations and percentages there. Like when this player is playing servant volley, where does the first volley go? And these uh, statistics from world-class players from the 50s have been for decades, the guidelines or even the rules where the coach would say, when you are in this situation, you should play the ball over there because that's the highest percentage, that's the best. And that is like following orders and it doesn't automatically uh, bring this awareness. That's the word Hervoya used a few minutes ago. I like the word awareness a lot because you have to be aware of what's happening. And as soon as you recognize my pattern, the game is going to be so easy for you. And so it's important that I can see that you recognize my pattern. I have to do something else to, to keep you honest. And that's a very simple principle, but it's so important that we create awareness and a feeling for the game and what to decide on which uh, factors. <coughs> Very good. From my side, just to add, I believe the stats that we get nowadays are very important. On the other hand, there's always a question uh, how we interpret uh, the statistics. Um, sometimes now I, I feel also that we are overemphasizing, for example, first two shots. Like uh, being able to play 10 shots is not important at all. <laughs> I like to say that nowadays these top players are playing so, such a short point because everybody can play 20 shots. <laughs> it's not that they can't. But uh, having these uh, stats, and especially about uh, stats about specific players, what actually the, all the coaches have been doing for a long time, actually, by scouting the opponents, just nowadays we have a different technology, and uh, why not to use it to involve it in the, in the coaching process? I think just, just to add on to a couple of points to bring out there, um, Craig O'Shaughnessy has done some really nice research on that. And I think what he did has done, I, I thought about this a lot intellectually, what he's done is he's brought people's awareness mm -hmm. to the importance of teaching the game and the reality in which it's played. So the reality of the play, 70% of the shots are done within the first four shots. And that, that's inarguable, you know, because it's important to be able to try and replicate the demands of the sport in our training environment. And there was probably too much high volume, high repetition of shots for the majority of tennis sessions throughout all of the junior years. And what was missing on that was specific game situation training, tactical training, decision-making training. It was just, can you hit 50, 100, 200 shots cross court? Now, the problem is, is the pendulum swung too far? Because as you said, Avoye, that you, that you develop that high repeatability, high threshold for different reasons. It's not just for tactical reasons, it's for physical reasons, stamina, endurance, for technical reasons, to see if you're, where your break point is technically. You know, to try and hit 20, 30, 40 shots past the service line in a row, you know, your technique's got to be good because you have to be able to repeat that over and over again without error. And that does challenge the player technically. It also challenges the player mentally because you need a, a, a lot of resilience if you start making mistakes. You need to be able to focus for a long period of time. Um, and, and there are millions of children in the world that play shots, <laughs> one to four shots at every point. That's their problem. They, they can't work the ball for long enough in order to have a high tolerance and high threshold to make the other person miss. Andy Murray has that mantra. I love that. He says, I will, I, you know, they can win the first set, but they'll never win it. I'll always win in three. They'll never win the match. You can win the first set, but I'll win the match. It's that, it's that kind of arrogant um, known quality that he has that 
I will break my players down physically and mentally by staying in the point. And that's linked to his game style and the way he plays the game. But but there's also a foundation there in place where he makes balls, that he's solid. He has high percentage tennis. So I'm all for training and replicating the demands of the game, the reality of the, the length of the points. However, when you go to a training environment, you should always, um, I mean, the British Army have this saying, is, I have to get this right, it's we, we train hard so we can fight easy. Yeah. Uh, you know, understand. So I really like that phrase. It's it's a British Army expression. We train hard so we can fight easy. So it's the idea that we we do more than we necessarily need to do. So when we come to play the game, playing one to four shots will be no big deal, and it won't be about playing errors or winners. It'll be about high threshold and, and high percentage tennis, women running, attacking, and defending. So there was just something I wanted to add on to that. Now, of course, the statistical analysis does allow us to do two things it allows us to assess our own game but more importantly that voyeur frank is it actually allows us to assess our opponents that's the purpose of charting opponent analysis so you know we did a lot of that at the lta we would we would have a big dart fish you know statistical program where we would assess and analyze a database a bank of players all over the world and it, and it filtered down to the juniors as well where we were really understanding the key tactical patterns on serve return and within the match um, of our of our opponents and what happens over time is that builds up a very picturesque um, image to, to both us and then to help us communicate to the players about how they could play that a player really effectively okay. so i think that's really the modern evolved way of using tactical analysis to help our players okay just to add something uh, to what you just said uh, when i look at the stats actually what i am afraid that um, many coaches can misinterpret is it's not about creating players who will look, uh, who will play according to the stats but actually the ultimate goal is to find a way to beat the player who is who have these standards and of course we know nowadays that 70 uh, percent as you said points are finishing four uh, inside four shots but the question is how the players will beat such players in the future what will be the next uh, way will it be even faster shots or they will try to find a way to extend the rallies I'm very interested, and if you ask me if I know the answer, no, <laughs> the next champion will find the answer, not me as a coach, it's obviously. But one interesting thing I hear from a mentor of mine a few weeks ago when I talked to him, and uh, he's now retired, has more time, and he said, you know, I am looking now at a lot of matches, and that was the time of ATP Masters and also the Davis Cups, and he said, you know, I noticed that actually now after first four shots, really the rallies are getting longer. He said, I didn't make an exact statistic, but I, I trust this guy because of his, I would call it, uh, experience eyes, yeah? And when we look at it, when nowadays the guys are hitting in average 130 uh, kilometers per hour forehands and backhands, they're able to play even seven, eight or 10 strokes. So perhaps one possibility in the future will not be to shorten the point, but to make them longer, but with unbelievable tempo. Uh, so. Yeah, I would like to hear what your uh, thoughts about it, what I just said. <laughs> Frank, do you want to? Well, yeah, sure. Um, I think the, 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 the answer to the question is that when, when both you and me as players are working on the best first four shots possible to be able to play a high quality point, and we still uh, keep up with each other, we need to extend the rally with high quality yeah. and and for me it's not just the the consistency training this uh, like not making mistakes no it is about high quality shots that can be in a sequence and and without making mistakes being under pressure still being able to build up instead of starting to defend and give opportunities to the opponent mm -hmm. so the, the for me the most important word is the quality of the shots while you are on court in training and in this way you can move borders and far too many coaches are working on what i call dull uh, consistency which is great for you know several mental elements and for focusing and whatever but when you talk about the next step in in levels on whether it's a national ranking or atp wta it means that you have to be stronger in being under pressure and still giving pressure back to the other player. That's all about quality under pressure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because one of, one of the things that I've been wrestling with is this whole concept that the game of tennis is less tactical now because it's more physical and technical. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think it's a really interesting question that, that it's clearly the game has changed. It's become more powerful, more athletic. Um, and, and when you look at players at Wimbledon, you know, when you watch them, you look at their forehand and the sound of the ball being hit and their footwork and court coverage. You know, you very, very rarely hear people saying, oh, my God, his tactics were brilliant today. He really got the game plan right. That's not something you necessarily hear that even the commentators talk a lot about and certainly not their coaches. But of course, we know there's stuff going on behind the scenes to help the players get their tactics right against the different opponents. So so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, um, when you take tactics as a plan and like uh, and, uh, analyzing the opponent and knowing exactly what he doesn't like and how you can attack that, etc., that's probably mostly linked to what you just mentioned. I'd like to give a more um, detailed example. We are playing doubles. I'm at the net and you hit a ball to me and Hervoy is your partner. Okay, so you just play the return, you play it to me. Now there's a big difference between you hitting the ball below net height to me because if I would now volley up to Hervoy, he closes in, he will kill me. Yeah. Um, But when the ball is a little bit too high, so your shot is above net height. Now I can really give um, Hervoy a, a, a terrible time there. So the first part there is to see, so to really have the right perception of the quality of Simon's shot coming to me as a net player and what I can do to that. And that is like the quick decision. It's only like two things. Is it high enough that I can uh, give Hervoy a bad time? Or is it so low that I want to stay away from Hervoy? I will just play it back to Simon, hope that the next shot will be a little bit higher. I can close in and finish the point. And this is very simple, but very basic. And that means perception there is the key to the right decision. Statistics don't help because the statistics that I should just volley it, um, try to finish the point by playing to Hervoy, I will certainly have some bruises on my legs, you know, doing it on the wrong shot. So you have to practice <coughs> it. And it's very simple. Is the ball high enough or low enough to do this or that? Practice that. So it should be totally optimized that you don't give it a second thought. And it's always effective. You see that with the best players. But with the juniors, they make stupid mistakes. Yeah. And then people talk about tech, uh, technique, like, yeah, his volume is not so good. And of course, it has to do with how you master this, um, the feeling on that shot, how your record face control is. But the elementary thing is, is it high enough or low enough for your shot to do this or that? And immediately see it, decide, take the right decision and try to, to, um, uh, to take the point after that. Uh, Simon, from my side, just say uh, that, <laughs> Perhaps when when you ask about the role of, let's say, tactics in modern game, many coaches that are on the tour, they will talk to you only about tactics, not about techniques. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that very often the commentators are misleading because they're always uh, emphasizing 220K serve or big forehands in terms of power, but not really how the guys apply it. And uh, I think a good example also of the role of the tactics is uh, how actually the second player of a uh, Croatian Davis Cup team played recently. I believe everybody know, you know about his name, Borna Goyo, who is a 280 ATP and won against uh, Sonego, Lajovic, that are top 30, top 40 players. Obviously, didn't, uh, he didn't uh, learn anything in, in terms of technique in the last two weeks. Eh? But uh, what I know, because I know his uh, coach uh, very well, uh, Goran Perpic, it's only about how he understands himself on the court, how responsible it is actually, how tactically he's playing the game. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would disagree that uh, the nowadays game is less tactical, but because it's so dominated with power, we forget to talk about it or really look at how, for example, top players are changing the tactics uh, by the score, how they, for example, by uh, Djokovic, when I was in Roland Garros, looking at him, 
changing the pace of his first serve between 200 and 140 Ks. And then uh, he, he did it against uh, Dimitrov after he lost the match in Madrid, if you remember, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. He destroyed him there because the Grigor didn't know what is coming. He has one-handed backhand, and when it comes slow ball, he has to make a swing to accelerate. If it comes fast, he has to block. And actually, nobody is talking about it uh, in terms of commentators, uh, but coaches are very much aware about it. <laughs> I think a couple of things that jumped out to me there, Frank mentioned doubles. I, I personally think, and maybe people don't agree with this, but I personally think the doubles is far more tactical than singles. Mainly because, look, there's, there's, there's way more game situations. It's not just serve both back, approaching the net, at the net. There's one up, one back, guy formation, serve and stay back, serve volley, serve charge and volley. There's, there's just way more different options and patterns that are available to you in doubles, which is why I would be a strong proponent of, of young children learning to play doubles in tandem with singles. It's not like you get to 12 and all of a sudden learn to play doubles. It's like, no, you play doubles as well as singles from the very start, even mini red, mini orange, because you'll learn about decision making in a very implicit way. Who should take that ball? Should I move forward? Should I take the lob? We should. The, the, the conversations occur out of the game of doubles that perhaps wouldn't occur from singles. Certainly coming to the net more is, is much more frequent when you play in doubles. Um so, so that, that, that's one thing. That I, I also believe that the game is clearly becoming more athletic. But to say it's not tactical would be naive because it clearly is. It clearly is still tactical. What do you think about um, sometimes the, uh, the adage that some people use is, well, women's tennis is less tactical than men's tennis. They play with less variation. Less. What are your thoughts about that stereotypical analysis that, that often gets banded around? Hmm. Frank, it's a provocative question. Start. <laughs> it's a provocative one, but I think we should unpack it because people, you know, I, I, I'm not the only person to hear that saying before, right? You've heard that one. Well, um, I think it's a bit more complicated. Um, what what I found in my experience is that girls are often more likely to um, to not experiment themselves and be more um, listeners or obeying the coach's orders. So play patterns, consistency, et cetera. Boys are on average more likely to experiment and be a bit more stubborn and uh, try other things. Um, so coming from there, um, it's quite logic that girls would be more limited in the things that they got from their training, not because they cannot do it, but because we as coaches um, did not get all the variation uh, in place. Then um, on court, what happens, it's still the time and space element that's decisive there. And whether you choose a heavy topspin shot cross court, giving a lot of running time to the opponent, or whether you hit a bit more flat to get this angled shot, which is not giving time to the opponent, is an essential part there. So the tactic still is there. But probably because of our training, um, girls are more limited. And then um, analysts would say, you know, they are not so tactical. But I've seen girls who really use the court so well and, and were really clever in giving the opponent a hard time. So it's, it's not that girls couldn't do it or don't want it, but it's probably more because of us coaches, how we educated them and how we kind of... <laughs> Um, uh, liked the way that they are just uh, obeying our orders. Mm -hmm. uh, to add here to what you just said, Frank, is also one more uh, important element that because the girls are maturing earlier, we know that uh, development of the player is very expensive. So very many parents that are very often the driving force behind are trying to accelerate the uh, way to the pros where the money is so i believe that also very often we don't give girls the time to develop a range of techniques and also tactics but actually narrowing down to let's call it winning tactics at the early age and then sticking to it so i fully agree with uh, actually what frank said that it's not that girls cannot but it's the way we practice with them yeah i mean one of the things that i'm I, i'm not sure about this but but I don't have a better explanation yet. So look, perhaps you can you can 
steer me to a different outcome. But one of the things that I, I, I felt for a long time is that the more weapons a player has, the less tactical they are. So I'll give an example. You know, Berrettini, when he's smacking down 135 mile an hour serves and his forehands at 95 mile an hour winners, it's like, well, how tactical does he need to be? It's big serve, big forehand. Serena, big serve, big forehand. So the more aggressive baseliner that you are, because I think that's something we should talk about now is game style development, is, is that the, you know, if you play the game, short points, big aggressive shots, there's not too much, there's not that much to it. It's pretty simple. But if you have less weapons... Um, and, and your weapon is your very like Ash Barty with nice slice, drop shot, change rhythm, moon ball, come to the net, um, side spin. You know, if, you, if you're more skillful, like the all court players, and you have less weapons, then you tend to be more tactical in the way in which you construct the point and, and play the point. So, is that something again? It's not everyone agrees with that, but it's something I've led to a natural conclusion that, that kind of makes sense to me. But does that make sense to you too, or would you, would you challenge that? Because I'm open to be challenged. I I, I would like to challenge it in a um, specific part, which we discussed a few minutes ago, when I talk about the quality of the shots. So when your weapons on whatever level are so good that <coughs> I cannot answer it, you don't need tactics. You're correct with your statement. But now that I'm able to, to deal with your fantastic shots, and it's taking longer and longer, you know, but you're not winning the point. That's where you will need tactics again to make better decisions, to make the court wider, for example, so that I cannot run down your second or third or tenth shot. So tactics come in as soon as your opponent uh, has answers to your normally or, or on average your great shots. And but do I, Frank, do I change my tactics there or do my tactics stay the same? It's like if I have to hit a big serve and a big forehand, does it just become big serve, big forehand, big forehand, big forehand? Do my tactics really change the more the ball comes back or does do I just have to sustain my simple tactic more frequently in a row? The, the basic pattern would be the same, but in choosing like more angle, less speed, more spin or uh, less slice or things like that. That's where your decisions are essential. So this is why this definition of strategy tactics, winning the, the match, uh, the game, um, the point is so essential to understand that it's all about this very quick um, uh, seeing of what's happening and making the right choice. And as long as you are using these 100% um, speed shots, you can never hit it more angle because it would go into the net or wide. Mm -hmm. So that's where you have to adapt. And as soon as you adapt, make um, choices to be more effective, that's where the decisions are there and that's where tactics come in. Mm. Fascinating. De Voye? What we are actually referring to is, in my impression, is that it's about uh, changing a rhythm. Like a main thing, <laughs> that perhaps you don't see as much as you would like to see in a modern game. It's more like a tempo game than changing a rhythm and then moving the opponent around the space and not just, let's call it left, right. Even though now we see also very often that all the top players are in, in using a much more drop shots because they are also good at the baseline. So perhaps one thing that is to be considered is also the body type, because we see that especially the players that are a bit shorter mm -hmm. are always using this, what, you are, uh, what we are emphasizing, like a need for the change of the rhythm. And uh, the big players, and uh, nowadays, the, most of these young players, the, the boys, now that are in my mind, like Rublev, like uh, uh, some other guys uh, that, uh, that we know about Sinner, are actually big guys with a lot of power and uh, it seems to me that it's just they're just using their best weapons yeah i mean that that, 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 that you know that, that that's talking about how the individual plays the game is, is probably a natural um evolutionary topic here because that was my point on the women's game it is often it's an unhelpful stereotype to say women are one-dimensional they just you know, bang, 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 change direction, change direction, change direction. You know, I think it, it's much more complex than that. I think there are many female players that play very, very tactical. Um, however, there is some research that suggests that women do drop shot less than men. 
They do come to the net less than men. Um, they do play the game differently. And differently is technically because they play with the much flatter shots, as we know, than the men. And therefore, there are some tactical implications to that. And look, I don't know if it's the tactical effect in the technical, the technical effect in the tactical, but, but it's clearly different in, when, when you look at scale uh, statistically over lots of different types of players. Okay, you have the Ash Bartis and the, um, the, the female players that play with a lot of variation and change of rhythm and drop shots and come to the net and stay back and kick serves. And there's a lot of different tactical um, variations there but 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 i but i think we should think well uh, frank made a good point is it social is it socially engineered i.e is the coach playing a big influence on that or it or does biology mean something here and, and therefore we know females typically um are, are physiologically as likely weaker than men and therefore that changes the way they hit the ball and therefore that does affect the way in which they play the game in order to win points. And Carl Meyers did some great research on this, as we both know on, I think his phrase was same game, different sport or same sport, different game or something like that, his phrase. And, and I really like that. It, you know, it's like the game is the same, but it's not the same. Let's be really clear. And if you coach and train it the same way, you may, I remember a Spanish coach saying that to me once. He said, um, we really got it right with the men and we really got it wrong with the women. And he was a top national coach. And I can't remember his, um, or he was at Sanchez Gasell. And, and, and I said, well, can you just unpack that for me? And he said, yeah, well, we recognize running around the forehand, run around the backhand, run around the backhand, heavy top spin forehand, heavy, heavy top spin forehand, heavy top spin forehand. That's really worked well as a foundational pattern, way of playing the game with young teenage boys. But we try to teach all the girls it as well. And it's not how the girls play the game. They won't always run around their backhand. They'll take the ball on the rise and not back up and let the ball drop with heavy spin. And therefore, we've probably been conditioning our females to a way in which the or the professional tour, the females just don't play like that. And I thought that was really fascinating, the, the, the way he identified that actually a pro, an approach for boys could be different to an approach from girls. And we need to think cleverly about that, both tactically and technically. Look, uh, Simon, I, for me, it's very simple. We are playing on the same court, but uh, even the girls are nowadays also much, much taller. The, the boys are taller and are actually they're covering bigger space because we are physically stronger. And that I hope will stay like that. I don't want that my wife is stronger than me. Eh? You know, <laughs> it's much better like this way. She's <laughs> mentally <laughs> much stronger than this way, trust me. <laughs> so, obviously, for me, when I was looking at the female game, it's a logic why they are going for down the line shots and so many, because actually the winner target is bigger because the, the way that uh, girls can cover the court compared to the men. And uh, it will be a difference. And uh, yeah, let's see what the future will bring us. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, have, a, I have a question for you guys. Who, who would you um, see as a tactical player in nowadays tennis? Men and, and women. What, what would be a good example for you of a tactical well, player? For, for me, yeah, for me, Frank, obviously, someone like Andy Murray, who, who I think has been a tactical wizard, gets himself out of trouble, causes trouble, um, to use Judy's phrase, um, very, very well. So he plays both offense, defense, and neutral well. You could say he could play offense better. He, you know, he's always criticized for not attacking enough with power and guiding the ball too much. But but overall, he was someone that I would call a tactical genius. You know, you would often watch him playing and go, wow, what a great decision in that situation. Uh, what a great idea to, to mix it up on that one. So you could have tactical conversations around Andy Murray all day watching him play. So he's someone, look, he's still playing. So I'm going to count him as still a player. He's still beat Nadal this week in uh, Abu Dhabi, I think. So, you know, he can still hit a good ball, Andy Murray, and he still plays the game well. But he's someone that I would label as tactically very, very um, uh, skillful. And female well, side, Frank. Yeah, yeah. Two female players like Barty or Halep. I would. Uh, I hope you agree that they are not so bad tactically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And when you think of the uh, Taiwanese player, um, I have some trouble with her uh, okay. with the pronunciation of the name. Um, but she is double-handed on both sides, yeah. and right. the variation is is fantastic. And a lot of players have no clue what she's going to do. <laughs> Yeah. And and this surprise element is is I think key in her game that makes her such a tough opponent. Yeah. And when you see her play, it doesn't look that that fantastic um, until the moment she is under pressure and you see what 
uh, decisions she, ta she takes and, and how she's able to, to uh, play uh, a kind of offensive ball in that situation. That's miraculous. And that, that's, also, that's the illusion of tactical skillfulness, isn't it? Because, you know, the players that we often... Uh, it's easier to label someone tactically um, skillful if they are like an all-court player or a counter-puncher. Because, you know, and Andy Murray is the typical counter-puncher, right? He's, you know, he retrieves, retrieves, stays in the point, stays in the point, lobs over the head, two-time pass, one-time pass. Because he stays in the point longer, he's got to have more schools, skills and tools to stay in the point for longer. Ash Barty, you know, real change of rhythm, come to the net, stay back, can play different surfaces. But but someone like Serena, would you label her as a great tactician? Well, well, the answer to that, I think, is yes, because she plays her patterns really well and she's won so many Grand Slams. Now, maybe she has less tactics in it maybe andy murray has 20 maybe she has five i don't know i haven't done the, the the stacks to prove myself right or wrong on that one but it's a general kind of intellectual concept mm -hmm. it makes sense to me that big serve big forearm big serve big forearm run around the middle run bang bang bang, bang. It, it, it's not too complicated to watch her play and know how she's going to win the game now you're right frank when the ball comes back more and more and more she has to have plan b or plan c or plan d or just play plan a better i don't know which one it is but um but 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 for me I think we have to be a bit careful when we talk about, you know, the, the, who is great tactically, because I think they're all great. Is John isn't a great tactically? Well, big serve, you know, big serve, big serve, Karlovich, big serve, big serve. There is, there is, there's not much tactics to it, but he does play that tactic very well. Now, here's a good example. Misha Zverev, you know, probably the last serve and volleyer, right? I, haven't, I, don't, I can't think of any other top 100 male players now that are serving volley and net rushing on everything, return of serve. Um, and, and so first serve, second serve. Now, was he good tactically? Well, you could say in a way, no, because he was the last man standing, right? There's no one else doing it. So maybe that wasn't good tactically to serve and volley on everything, because unless your serve is a weapon, um, it's going to be very difficult to deal with really, really good returns. But then is he good tactically because he does something that other people don't do? So, so just to finish my point on this, if, if I ask your opinion on this, the, Span the Spaniards, Everyone says, well, we should train more players to play like the Spaniards. And boy, even you said that a minute ago, like the Spanish system's got it right. They they like to make balls and they like to... You know, uh, I have to correct you. It's because they created their ident tactical identity. Tactical I don't want identity. to say it better. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Now, now the but the interesting thing with that is I would challenge that because, but well, well who's tactical identity? Because I tell you what, Nadal, as an aggressive pace liner, plays very different tactically to David Ferrer as a counterpuncher, who plays very differently to Feliciana Lopez, who's an all-court player, often serve and volleyer. So, like, the three best male players in the last 10 to 15 years in Spain all play completely different. They didn't play the same at all. I mean, they couldn't be any for... One plays like Tim Henman, one plays like, um, you know, absolute Leighton Hewitt, and one plays like, you know, a big all-court... Sorry, a big aggressive baseliner. So, to me, the Spanish way is, is more complex than just vamos, vamos, run around the backhand, hit with heavy spin. Well, maybe that's a foundational approach, uh, 14 and under, but it's in my opinion that actually a cultural identity is more than the way they just play the game. It's more their values, their work ethic, their footwork, their vamos, their competitiveness. That's the cultural thing that the, that joins the Spaniards together. But but the way they play the game is not the same at all. And in fact, the, way the, the best players that play the game have been polar opposite from each other. And that's been a really interesting point, which no one ever talks about. Yeah, I, I'd like to say a few things on that. Um, your last sentences are a lot about a personal game style. And of course, you have to know yourself very well to be able to play um, your best tennis with your personal game style. Play from your heart. I've mentioned that before. It's, it's yeah. essential. Um, what I liked in your previous um, statements is when you talked about plan B and plan C, um, so, of course, Serena Williams is a great player, but when you think of her plan B and C, I almost dare to say it's not there. If you compare right. her to another great player a long time ago, of course, Steffi Graf, she had a very um, uh, clear uh, preference to play her game with a dominant forehand and a slice backhand, but actually she was, in my Point of view more tactical because she did have a plan b and plan c <coughs> right. when you think of guys like medvedev and djokovic who are 
uh, over the last year, number one and two for sure, these guys, they use a lot of um, variation in, in the pace of the ball, like playing some slower slices just to get the rhythm out of that rally and then take over again. So they're kind of teasing the opponent, not just by hitting their, their best personal or individual shots, but by mixing up some shots to break the rhythm and then take over again. And I think that is like detailed, um, those are detailed examples of plan B or plan C. And there are quite a few players you just mentioned that you would not um, uh, think of in that way, like John Eastner or other great servers, or, because they have a defined game type, which yeah. I really challenge coaches and players to find out because you have to be reflective, you need awareness and all the things we talked about. But especially that plan B and C, as you mentioned it, I thought that is probably a decisive thing to determine whether a player is a tactical master or not. Interesting, interesting. Hello? Yeah, just to come back to what you said, the fitness <coughs> for, uh, for Spanish players, just to clarify one more time, I was talking about the game identity, let's say like that, and not the that they are playing uh, the same. Sure. Also, when we looked at 25 years ago, then Spanish players were looking more similar, but nowadays I believe this is the difference because now they are allowing players to establish their own game style much more. They're not constrained, perhaps, with the, the way they practice like before, because they learned <laughs> it's not enough. Yeah. So um, this is one thing. And the, the other thing is, perhaps from my side now, for you guys, a question. Of course, we agree that plan A, plan B, C, and so on, and uh, we have different ways to play the game. But how do, would you see that uh, we can put it like a tactical development pathway? What would be for you the key elements to teach the kids? So how to play the game at the age of eight in red, uh, orange, and then up to the top junior uh, or professional game? What would be the, like a key things for you to work on? I think it would be very interesting for our audience to hear from you guys. Yeah, just... I, I lectured on this just quite recently, actually, Voye. So this is current in my thinking. Look, I, I think I think it's complex that question because you've used age as the fundamental characteristic in which to define some type of development pathway. The reality is is that we know that the stage of someone's development will determine the way in which they play the game. It's been made more complicated by red, orange, and green because what we've allowed children to do. Uh, because of their actual height and scale linked to the length and width of the core to the size of the racket and ball we've adapted and modified all the different elements of playing the game in order to allow children to play more advanced skills on, on a scaled appropriately scaled court so if we if i use this model to answer your question let's say there's beginner red intermediate red advanced red beginner orange intermediate orange advanced orange beginner green and, and and so on okay so there's almost three stages within each stage which i know adds layers of complexity to it but that's obvious if someone comes to you for the first ever tennis lesson at eight years of age you're not going to do the same things tactically you're not going to start asking them to do a dry volley and a stretch volley or you can also do a moon ball to the back and run around the floor and attack the ball on the rise the complexity of the tactic is determined by the skill level as well so if you cannot do something tactically if you cannot do it technically I do believe that's still to be true. And, and then physical skills are linked to that as well. So someone's physiological development, someone's cognitive development, someone's technical skill execution does determine a little bit on the range of different tactics that a player can do. So I'll give you a practical example. The X pattern, which is the idea of a little short jabby backhand slice. You bring the player in and then go deep down the line. So they have to move diagonally forwards, diagonally back. That's a very complicated tactic to, to kind of, execute because you have to have a very short little jabby slice which is an advanced skill you then have to be able to hit the ball very deep down the line on on the second shot in order to con complete the pattern well i'm not going to do that with an eight-year-old girl i don't think that's absolutely um essential for them to now am i saying that every nine eight nine ten year old kid can't do that no i'm not saying that because remember to finish my point at stage three beginner red intermediate red advanced red if you're advanced like national level red national level orange national level green national level 12s you can do many many things that the professionals do you just do it at a slower tempo you just do it with um 
with your coordination skills. You just do it to, to your level. But, but you can do it. You can execute a lot of different tactics at a young age. And you've seen these great points on YouTube at Red, Orange, and Green. And Emma Raducanu recently, you saw an amazing point from her, the US Open winner, when she was nine years of age, doing these different types of tactics. It looked almost as good as the professional game. It's very, very similar. Maybe not exactly the same, but very, very similar. The difference, of course, is the physicality at which is executed and, and therefore linked to the technique. But, 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 but to answer that question would almost require a session in itself. I, I guess the big picture is at the end of each age and stage where you're playing the highest level tennis, that can look very similar to the professional game. And we can ask very demanding things of players because they will have the skill levels in order to do it. The reality is that when you're beginner red, beginner orange, beginner green, beginner 12s, begin, and intermediates, then, then they will not be able to execute. So the things that are more important there are high threshold, um, starting the point, returning with consistency, playing high percentage tennis, um, not making stupid decisions. I, I have this four-point plan, which I think works really well. And the four-point plan is this. Play the phase of play right. Make sure you choose to rally, attack, and defend correctly. That's really, like, you have to do that. That's the basic tactics of tennis. Rally, attack, and defend at the right time. Point number two, make high percentage decisions. Don't do a drop shot on that one. Don't go for two big first serves. Um, uh, don't run to the net on that one. You know, high percentage decision making will really help you to win more points, lose less points. Point number three, um, position yourself on the court geometrically correct. Don't stand too close, not too far back, not too far forward, not too far to the right, not too far. Space, they just don't stand in the right place. And then finally, point four is basic strength against your opponent's weakness. You know, play your forehands more to their backhands. It's like so many kids don't even do that. And I'm not saying that's always the strength and the weakness, but as a whole, if we taught most kids that principle, I think they'd be in a good place tactically. So those four points are a developmental start for me, like play the phases of play right, rally, attack and defend, play high percentage tennis, position yourself on the court correctly. And then finally, play your strengths of the opponent's weakness. If you do those four things well, under 12, you'll be in a great place. I think over 12, it becomes way more complex, linked to the game style development of the athlete. Long it answer. Very but it, it looks very that, complicated. Very, very <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it is complex. Sometimes the, you have to embrace the complication. It's like, I agree with you. I think it is. Quite, if it was easy, we'd all have World Grand Slam champions, and we don't. So it can't be that easy. It takes a lot of time and volume repetition and a lot of exposure to different tactical game situations. And, and then the players will get more skillful in their tactics. I'm sure of that. But like Frank said, if they just do cross-court forehands <coughs> throughout the teenage years, then perhaps they're going to be limited in tactically what they can do because of the engineering that we've created in our, in our practices with our players. So that, that's, that's a developmental vision that I have for players, this idea of understanding stages, understanding that at the top stage you can do many things, but 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 as a, as a foundational element, those four point plan, I think is a great place to start with all your players. Frank, yeah, we, I, we have another ten minutes for you, and then we finish. You know that? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the the four points uh, Simon just gave, um, they're true. For me, um, they are too general. So it's true, but too general, um, and. And also when you talk about all the details, um, making it complicated, I, I have a different view, but um, let me try to explain it in, in two ways. First of all, the different um, colors of uh, phases of, of tennis kids or whatever you call it in, in the countries, it's the, the size of the court and the speed of the ball is related to the body of the players. It's like a, uh, a relation. It's like so many steps away from your body and you have smaller legs so you can run it down. That means that the, the space is adapted to the size of the player. So it's a very natural and very gradual uh, development of the game. And of course, you have to develop the shots to be able to play those um, <laughs> space using shots, like uh, making you run and to, to uh, hit an, an angled cross-court shot so that you have to run a bit more and then go to the other side. So in this way, I think it is almost similar whether you play on a red court or you play as a 16-year-old on a full court. 
Um, so th that is the first thing I'd like to, to, to explain. The second thing is, and this goes back to a worldwide conference in um, Turkey where uh, the French guy, um, I forgot his name, and I saw him uh, two, three years back in, in uh, Bangkok um, and, and, or in Hong Kong. And he um, is the French guy who did several presentations. And I'm, I'm, I apologize to the guy um, that I forgot his name. Maybe Hervoy, you can help me. But what he did, he had Turkish young players. He didn't speak the language because he is French. They didn't speak French or English. So, you know, it was difficult. He had a very small court made on a, um, uh, a small piece of carpet with lines on it and a net. And he had Smurfs. Mm -hmm. Remember this one? Smurfs yeah. on the court. So he put there uh, the, the, what is it, Gargamel, and he had uh, one of the Smurfs, and then the, the, the red Smurf, the, the, the big okay. one, he, he was like the referee. And then he was asking these players, look, he is here and he is there. Where would you play the ball? And uh, like pointing to the player and what would you do? And, and they can <coughs> see that. And what he used was the principle of the bird's view from the air, it's so much easier to see the open spaces. And without language, he made very, in a very simple way, he showed them where would you play the ball? Now he has to go there, what would you do now? And then he would take that to a red court or an orange court. And it is so interesting to see that, that we as adults have a different view on the court compared to uh, kids who are half our size. So the principle of showing them the bird's view and then projecting that to let's try this, you know, stop the game, stop the player in the position. Where would you hit it now? Oh, you go there. Yeah, great. Let's see if he can get it. So make them aware. Again, Hervoya mentioned the word awareness. This awareness is essential in playing the game, developing shots, because the kid will be more motivated to try to hit this angled shot. Like, oh yeah, I also want to make him run. Oh, that's a great idea. And I think this makes it really simple, but very concrete. So that's one of the examples I, I certainly want to share with you and, and the people who are listening to our presentation. From my side, I can just add to all these elements that you have just mentioned that for me is very important when I'm working with the players that they understand some tactical concepts, like concept of big target. We, we all uh, shout to the players, don't go for the line, but we are talking about mm -hmm. the concept of the big target. And uh, that, such things for me are very important. And then to link it with some clues to make decisions before the point, to decide about my pattern or during the point, how to react. Uh, and uh, obviously to link it with all these elements, personality, technical, physical, and other things. So. I believe that uh, we covered a lot of things uh, during uh, our conversation today and uh, hope that people will find some additional ideas and be motivated to, uh, to do the right job by the next uh, practice. Thanks. From my side, I would like to thank you both guys for today. <laughs> thank you. No, listen, thank, thanks to the two of you. It's a really healthy discussion and debate around tactics. I hope it comes across just our passion for the topic. We we love the game and we love watching the game and analyzing the game to its micro level. And and tactics is 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 an important thing to discuss. And like you said, there's probably been an evolutionary movement away from tactics a little bit because of the you know the changing way in which we hit the ball and the mental skills and the physical skills. And and we can't forget about the importance of tactics in helping our players to win more points and lose less points. Because I do believe that you can be technically and physically and mentally inferior to your opponent, but but the tactics can be better and you can win the match. So tactics really do play an important role in 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 the sport and how we and how we coach it. And I, I think maybe the next conversation we have if you if you if you would agree would be more about that practical application for coaches around tactical implementation with players and uh, we could talk about you know key patterns and how we teach decision making and how we have tactical game situation stories how we set that up there's so much more we can we can dive into thanks everyone and uh, we'll see you soon bye bye